Uh, my name is Christos Similidis, and I teach Byzantine literature at the University of Thessaloniki. My major research project is a critical edition of the poems of Gregor of Nazianzus uh, for the Corpus Christianorum series. Uh, it is great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Gabrielle Thomas today and her book entitled The Image of God in the Theology of Gregor of Nazianzus. Probably I need to do something. Uh, published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Gabrielle Thomas lectures in early Christian and Anglican studies at Yale University and is an ordained priest in the Church of England. Her publications include, apart from her book we present today, articles in the Scottish Journal of Theology, Exchange, Ecclesiology, and Studia Patristica. She has also co-edited a volume on women and ordination in the Orthodox Church, published in 2020, which includes contributions uh, from Father John Baer, Father, Father Andrew Louth, and Mary Cunningham. Her research interests include the retrieval of early Christian theological anthropology, the Cappadocians and suffering, and her current research explores the role of Satan in early Christian and mystic, in early Christian mystical theology. Uh, the book presented today, The Image of God in the Theology of Gregory of Nazianzus, is a revised version of Gabrielle's University of Nottingham doctoral thesis, supervised by Mary Cunningham. It is an impressive study which makes a major contribution to the thought and the theology of the Cappadocian Fathers, and especially Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, it offers a close analysis of Gregory's writings, and by focusing on Gregory's sensitive interpretation of scripture, it demonstrates how Nazianzus depicts both the nature and experience of the image of God uh, throughout his corpus. Gabrielle argues that the human being as the image, icon of God in the theology of Gregory is divine yet vulnerable. As I was looking through the book, uh, something that I liked a lot was uh, the careful attention um, Gabrielle pays to Gregory's poems. And uh, this is actually a book that opens and closes with Gregory's verses. And the Probably some of you don't know, this is a massive poetic corpus. It is not easily accessible in reliable editions or translations. And these poems are demanding, uh, they in fact require commentaries very often. So it is a significant achievement that Gabrielle has succeeded in taking them into full account. And I do hope that um, her book will highlight for future studies as well that the poems are not less significant than the orations or the letters uh, for establishing uh, Gregory's complex thought. So I will now hand over to Gabrielle for her presentation. To our organizers, thank you for organizing this wonderful festival and Professor Similidis for your introduction. Um, and yes, I do appreciate Gregory's poetry too. And also to all of you who are listening on Zoom. So my book began as a paper for a church history course whilst training for ordination in the Church of England. Um, I began my academic career as a classicist and then later as a seminarian, I found myself drawn towards the Greek fathers and particularly to Gregory Natsianzen. I appreciate the way that he crafts his theological work in virtually every Greek literary form in order to make himself heard. He's a figure who attracts both contemporary theologians and Byzantinists alike. And as someone who is both a scholar and a priest, I found his work helpful when thinking through my own vocation. So my book is the first full length analysis of Gregory's vision of the image of God commonly known as the Imago Dei, as depicted in Genesis chapter one. And I aim to challenge the accepted scholarly view that Gregory depicts the image of God only as the soul, psuche, or the noose, the aspect of the soul. And I argue that Gregory's vision extends much further than this, and that the image relates also to the whole human person. 
So to demonstrate this, the book explores Gregory's treatment of the unity and the visibility of Christ, who he describes as the identical image. And for Gregory, this means that human images are formed according to the likeness of Christ. And I also explore the way in which Gregory plays on contemporary ideas about images and idols in relation to the human image. His description of Christ and the human image as living beings is significant, since this forms a significant difference between the human and other kinds of images and statues. The human image is infused with the spirit at creation, meaning that she's a living being. And this sets her apart from idols, which are static and lifeless in comparison. Gregory develops this um, very interestingly, I think, in one of his poems um, through his treatment of women who wear cosmetics. Drawing on the Genesis creation narratives, Gregory imagines God's response to a woman who wears cosmetics as a means of enhancing her beauty. In a section of his poem, employing the rhetorical device of ethopoeia, Gregory assumes God's voice and he lays out what God would say to a woman who bears cosmetics. He writes, who is and whence came the creator? Be gone, one who belongs to another. I did not inscribe you, dog, but I molded an acorn, an image of myself. How is it then that I have an idol in place of a dear form? So for Gregory, cosmetics turn the human image into an idol. He treats the human image quite literally as a visible image of God who should be worshipped. And there's a wonderfully vivid account of his oration on baptism in which he describes how the devil will try to tempt the newly baptised to worship him. Gregory explains that the baptised must not buy down to the devil. They must say to the devil, I too am the image of God. You must worship me. Gregory demands worship from the devil precisely because the human person is an image of God. Human images are quite literally visible divine images who bear God's presence. For Gregory, this means that they're dynamic and not static, and they have therefore the potential for spiritual growth and theosis. Secondly, I've argued throughout the book that biblical and extra biblical texts comprise significant sources for Gregory's imagination. Locating the drama with his depiction of Christ, Gregory follows the human image from her creation through to her fall and subsequent restoration and theosis. Having been banished from paradise, Gregory locates the human image within a cosmological struggle against the world, the flesh and the devil, which is interpreted most coherently in light of biblical and extra biblical themes. Although Gregory is undoubtedly influenced by some philosophical sources, I argue that we lose important aspects of meaning if we don't attend to his application of scripture. And this is, is crucially important in understanding Gregory's consistent narrative of spiritual warfare encountered by the human image with the devil. And the final argument which runs throughout the book speaks to the scholarly debate about Gregory's description of the image as divine. For some scholars, it's quote, merely rhetoric. For others, it's ontological. I argue that if we consider together four different threads that run through his work, we might draw at least one conclusion. So if we read Gregory's theological anthropology in which God creates the human person specifically to be porous to the spiritual realm, if we read that alongside his very high nematology and the lengths to which he goes in order to argue the consubstantial divinity of the Holy Spirit, his approach to baptism as the sacrament through which the Holy Spirit deifies the human image, and also his interaction with the devil after baptism, in which he demands worship. I argue that if we weave together these th four threads in his thought, 
then we must take his ideas about a divine image seriously. And we may understand the divinity of the human image as both ontological, functional, ethical, relational, and experiential. This reading of Gregory's vision of the human image contributes not just to what's, uh, what we're discussing amongst ourselves in late antiquity, but also to contemporary discussions in Western theological anthropology by serving as a critique of those interpretations that seek to categorize the Imago Dei into one neat category only. Gregory's approach recognizes the complexity of human existence. His non-reductive approach to the human image holds together a multifaceted interpretation of the image, which incorporates every gender, race, age, and ability. All human persons may participate in God and function as an image of God, precisely because they bear God's presence and point to their creator. Unlike the modern concern, which debates how human persons should be distinguished over other animals respect, with respect to the Imago Dei, Gregory distinguishes human persons as they relate to other kinds of images and idols. And this shifts the debate on human uniqueness on the basis of rationality over and against other animals. My book concludes then by arguing that contemporary theologians would be well served by entering into a conversation with this great theologian of late antiquity. Thank you.